Are you struggling to come up with original content week in and week out? Start a podcast. Interview your ideal clients. Let them talk about what they care about most and never run out of content ideas again. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to the B2B Growth Show, a podcast dedicated to helping B2B executives achieve explosive growth. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. I'm James Carberry. And I'm Jonathan Green. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to the B2B Growth Show. Today we are joined by Laura Patterson. Laura is the president of Vision Edge Marketing. Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Delighted to be here. It's fantastic to have you on the show today. I'm actually, I'm on the road. I'm back in San Diego right now, um, back uh, in my hometown of San Diego for the holidays. So, um, you know, it's it's just, it's fantastic that we're still able to connect, even though you know, I'm, I'm moving around. It's one of the one of the most brilliant parts, I think, of of getting to host a podcast. And today we are going to be talking about the five things that best in class marketers do better than their peers, which I think is going to make for some fantastic content. But of course, Laura, before we get into today's topic, maybe you can tell our listeners a little about uh, yourself, Vision Edge Marketing, and what you and your team are up to these days. Wonderful. Um, So Vision Edge Marketing is located here in Austin. By the way, I love San Diego. I think it's a (laughs) remarkable city. Um, It's nice to live in Austin, Texas, too. We we, uh, founded the company in 1999, so we're going on 19 years. And we started on the premise of um, being a data-driven, a metrics-based, outcome-oriented, customer-centric, a strategic and product marketing company. That's really was the impetus. And when we started with that premise, that was all very, very new. Of course, today, everyone is talking about how important it is to be data to insights-driven and have strong analytical muscle uh, to be outcome-oriented and customer-centric. So these are all very common buzzwords today. Uh, they weren't in 1999, and it's exciting to see that um, the world and uh, us have sort of met each other, so Mm -hmm. to speak. And so that's where we began. And it's really our focus is to help companies use the ingredients of of insights and and measurement, um, performance management, um, processes uh, to drive growth, create value and improve performance. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and it's so fantastic to have someone on the show that's uh, sort of had an eye for for tracking these metrics, these numbers for so long. I mean, you have you and uh, and your team have kind of this uh, this long term ongoing marketing performance benchmark study. Am I on point with that? You are. And it, it started in 2001. And we've been really, really fortunate to have great partners all, over the years to help keep the momentum going. And as a result, we've been able to collect uh, some really interesting uh, longitudinal data. So that's exciting. Yeah, very exciting. One of the reasons that uh, that you and I were able to connect in, in the first place. So we're going to be, of course, referencing some of that data that you have as we talk about these five things that you know best in class marketers do better than their peers. So I don't want to get ahead of today's topic, but Laura, kind of, um, I got the sense that today we're going to be starting just real briefly talking about the pressure for marketers to be able to um, sort of connect the dots between the work of marketing and uh, the, the value to, to the actual business. Like, so, so sort of take it away from there. I w- I'd be happy to. And I think that it's always helpful to have context. So Jonathan, some other data out there that kind of is important around what we're going to share. So there was a study done uh, by KPMG um, not very long ago, and it was really talking about what the expectations are of the board, of the CEO. And one of the things that came out of that is that 90% of the organizations are really expecting the CEO to move the organization to growth. And so everyone's been talking about that. 2018 is the the mantra is growth. The the mandate is to grow. Mm -hmm. And research by Deloitte and the CMO Council kind of following that said, you know, 70% of these CEOs expect the CMO to actually lead this revenue growth charge to be at the forefront of that. Unfortunately, at the same time, 
uh, a Forbes study came out and said, you know, they may expect it, but CEOs don't have a lot of faith in their CMOs <laughs> because they <laughs> – so so you've got this sort of dichotomy. There's an expectation but lack of faith because they're still struggling to really show how they are helping the organization realize the results, right? So being able to make those connections. And so um, one of the things that happened about a year ago is we – the tenure of CMOs began to kind of decline again. And so there's just this whole sort of, you know, storm of things occurring at the same time, this force, this, you know, growth force uh, that's occurring, this whole momentum around growth, the fact that um, the CMOs um, need to really make, take the lead. And at the same time, uh, some challenges that they're having. So the pressure is really on them. And you might have seen um, the recent Forrester study that predicted that CMOs may even be eclipsed by chief growth officers. So CMOs actually are at risk and they know they're at risk. Uh, So let's talk about what some of them are doing really well and then in the area of being able to connect the dots and um, where the challenges are and then some of the other things that we see happening as a result of this work. Mm -hmm. So was that good context? That's oh my goodness! It's a that's a brilliant context. I think you're speaking uh, definitely our our audience's language right now. I think you uh, you know I, I think you had their curiosity and now you have their interest. You know CMOs may be at risk. Okay, let's let's take it away from there. So this study that we're going to talk about from last year, and we're hoping that we'll be able to do it again next year. As I said, it's been going on since 2001. It's an online study, and this year we had what we would say over 400 qualified uh, study participants, lots and lots more than that, but we're really, really careful about uh, quarantining uh, data that doesn't seem like it's coming from legitimate sources. So um, 30% of the participants reflected the C-suite. So I think that's important to know. That would be CEOs, CFOs, COOs, and the presidents of companies. We had really great representation of all sizes, all industries from B2B and B2C around the world. And what's interesting, there's nothing statistically significant in the data about those nuances. It's all pretty much the same, regardless of where they're located, how big they are, uh, and what kind of industry they are in. Mm -hmm. And the results of this study are actually projectable, between 95% plus or minus 4.75%. So that's really very, very uh, important to know. We're not just making stuff up. It's actually (laughs) has has, uh, really valuable uh, data that can be applied to everyone. So as we're speaking to you, speaking here, It's not like you say, that doesn't mean me. It really does mean just about everybody. And one of the other things that's interesting is when we're starting to talk about the best-in-class marketers and how we characterize them is they don't really have anything different about their budget. They have the same percentage of budget as the big guys, the small guys, and anywhere. So it's not about money. And Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important thing because it's really easy for us to say, well, that's because they have more money than we do. And, um, and we're that I, I just want to let people know that that's not really true at all. Yeah. So that's a little bit of, of setup. So what have we what have we learned? We've been tracking the data for a very long time, and we kind of just decided to go ten years back in the data for this report just to see what the trends were. And what we noticed, and a very critical question we ask and have asked every year is what grade the C-suite gives their marketing organization for their ability to prove marketing's value, impact, and contribution to the business. And we ask them to grade them. We use a very traditional scale, 90 to 100 for an A, 80 to 89 for B, 70 to 79 for C, and then 69 or less. And that's how we organize all of the data. And that's Mm -hmm. how we characterize the groups. And what's been interesting is that it's been pretty consistent that about one in four, one in five marketing organizations earn this A. And that hasn't changed in a decade. That hasn't changed. And so that's a little, un, you know, disappointing to see that there are the ranks of, of the best in class are not increasing. Mm-hmm. The next group is a very large group and uh, they're about 40%. And the next group, which are the, the folks that are lagging, that's a group we're kind of concerned about because it's growing. It, it's also about 40%. So, and, and, and climbing, and that's the, that is a little unnerving considering how much emphasis has been placed on data, on analytics, on metrics, on process, 
on performance management and on marketing technology over the last few years. So you would expect to see that those things would be getting would be beginning to have an impact and we would see the best in class group increasing and the lagging group declining, right? Yeah. Would, that would be an expectation. And so that was a hypothesis that we went into this year's study that those things would be beginning to pay off. And unfortunately that was not <laughs> proven. <laughs> the absolute so, opposite was was proven. Yeah, that, yeah, the, that the people yeah. who are doing so, it well has remained sort of uh, static and stagnant. And despite you know, on the, this focus that you're talking about, the people who are doing it poorly has, has actually increased. And this was, this was kind of a point that you and I had talked about, you know, I had, I had the opportunity to talk to you before we recorded a few weeks ago. And I had mentioned, you know, there's so many people out there with, with a voice. Now there's so many people that are trying, are vying for your attention. They're trying to get, you know, eyeballs on the page, you know, kind of clicks to the website. And so they're, they're producing an insane amount of, of content. And we have all these incredible uh, tools and resources at our disposal. But despite the fact that everyone has a voice, not everyone is right. Not everyone knows what they're doing or what they're talking about. And now they're, they're so they're, they're pumping out misinformation. So there's all this information, but so much of it is bad at the same time. Yes. Well, that is what happens in all industries. We see that everywhere. So that's true. You're exactly right. So what we decided we would do is, okay, if it's not, if maybe let's go with the assumption that it's not the MarTech, all right, because everyone's, uh, most companies are investing a significant portion of their dollars, anywhere from 15 to 30% of their marketing budget is being allocated to MarTech these days. Mm -hmm. Pretty, pretty consistently. There's been a lot of data around that. In fact, I think, um, Mm -hmm. There's a recent study done by Gartner that's talking about this, how the spend, marketing spend is being allocated. And that would be if people are interested in, in learning more about that. So we said, okay, we have been talking about these groups of marketers for quite a while and we have created personas for them. And so these best in class marketers, we uh, were able years ago to characterize them as value creators. And these are really a group of marketers who uh, focus on creating value for our customers and the business and connecting the work of marketing and the investments of marketing uh, to very specific quantifiable business um, outcomes. Uh, the middle of the pack, those 40% of marketers, we call those the sales enablers. And uh, they are see their primary role as being in service to the sales team. And I think this is an important distinction between the value creators and the service sales enablers. The value creators are still very partnered with the sales organization, but they see them as partners. They collaborate together. In fact, marketing oftentimes is taking the lead, particularly strategically. In the sales enablers, it's a different kind of relationship in that they're at these, the sales enablers are servicing the sales organization mm. as opposed to collaborating with them. And so it is a nuance, but it's really important because they see their customer as the sales team. Yep. And that's a little bit different orientation and a nuance that's important to distinguish between value creators and the uh, sales enablers. That that last group, that laggard group, those are our campaign producers. And these folks are really, really good at the, the work of marketing. They still do a lot of measurement and they use a lot of data, but they kind of see themselves as a service provider. They kind of operate like an internal organization or internal agency to the team. And it's all about kind of producing on demand, right? So not not to belittle anyone in that organization because that, that they're really very valuable and they're very very talented. But they tend to be specialized into key areas that they know how to do well. They don't think in the big picture about you know how they're contributing to the to the overall business outcomes because they're in their their roles of being producers. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's an important thing to know about them. Interesting. So we've okay. So we've got sort of these three categories. You've got you've got the, mm-hmm. the upper echelon value creators. Below that, the sales enablers, and sort of slightly below that, the campaign producers. Each one, like you said, uh, you know, are do certain things well, but you want to find yourself in this like sort of value creators segment, the ones that are collaborating with your with your sales, not just enabling, and not just being so hyper specialized in terms of uh, producing, you know, marketing campaigns that you've lost sight of, of the bigger picture. So 
you know, if it's not, as you mentioned, uh, a question of size, budget or industry, you know, across the, you know, the, the, the almost 20 years of, of studies that you've done. Um, but it, it does consistently come down to five capabilities that again, these best in class marketers do better than their, than their peers. Let's talk about it. What are we talking about, Laura? Okay. I'm, I want to talk about those and then we'll come back around to how does that translate into things that matter to the C-suite? Cause mm-hmm. I think that's going to be important too. Mm-hmm. So there, there's, let's talk about these five things. First and foremost is what we call business acumen. And this is a really an interesting thing because uh, the CMO of Juniper networks recently talked about this in an article he wrote as saying that, you know, marketers need to be business people first. And we've been saying that for years in this research and it's, we, we capture that in business acumen. And this is actually being able to understand the business in its entirety and to exercise really good judgment because you are connected to the business uh, as opposed to thinking about marketing, you're thinking about the business. And mm-hmm. value creators, they still have opportunities to grow here, but on a scale of one to 10 in terms of being able to demonstrate really good business acumen, they score like a 7.1. That doesn't seem like a really good grade. I mean, if your kids came home with a 70 out of 100, you probably wouldn't like be, you know, you know, breaking out the champagne. But, <laughs> but if you compare that to sales enablers, they get like 6.5 and campaign producers, they get like a 5.4. So that's a failing grade, right? And you would be really disappointed in that. So that's the number one thing. So all marketers can get better at that. This does not take technology. um, This doesn't take any of that. This is just about investing in understanding your company, your competitors, your customers, your market, you know, good old basic, you know, business, you know, skills, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Listening. (laughs) <laughs> listening to what's going on uh, when the leadership team is talking about their challenges and their opportunities. I'm still amazed sometimes when I work with a uh, marketing organization, some marketing organizations, I'll say, who are your top uh, 20 customers? What products do you sell to them? What's your opportunity for growth with them? You know, what is your strategy for increasing your footprint within each of those uh, businesses? What's your current share of wallet? Questions like that. And it's like deer in the headlights, right? <laughs> You know, and same thing when talking about market segments and market opportunities. So really every marketing person should should know that. Mm -hmm. The second uh, thing is they really do know how to select the right metrics. And there's a there is a formula to selecting the right metrics. And this is related to data. uh, But metrics take data, but they're not necessarily the same thing. So value creators are much better at picking and selecting metrics that matter to the C-suite. And much better mastery at selecting the right uh, metrics. And they are able to make their metrics form what we call and have um, trademarked as metrics chains. These are impact of value metrics chains. So the the measures that they select and the metrics that they use form a chain that goes from the work of marketing to the results that marketing affects. And so they can use that. And then that uh, allows them to really understand what data they have to hone in on, and whether that's customer data or competitive data or market data, performance data. It's all kind of becomes much clearer because they can see exactly what's going to be salient. And that's often because they've done a really good job in their planning. Their plan is different. Their plans are structured in such a way as they have this hierarchy kind of built in. So a lot of marketers build plans. Almost every marketing organization has a plan, whether that's in PowerPoint or in Excel or some other document. The challenge is often that it's really just a list of things that marketing is going to do, when they're going to do it, and how much it's going to cost. And that's not really a plan, right? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of interesting. I mean, you know, my husband's in construction, so I, I often um, talk about the difference between the list of materials that you're going to need and when you're going to need them and how much they're going to cost uh, in constructing a home as opposed to the actual real blueprint right. of what that house is going to look like and what the picture is going to be at the end and how it's going to sit on the site and a bunch of different things, right, that mm-hmm. go into the blueprint. Uh, the fourth thing, so the first three, acumen, metrics, and the chains, um, the fourth thing is they are willing, the best-in-class markers of value creators are willing to put a stake in the ground and set a performance target that they think is going to be the number they have to reach or achieve in order to move the dial for the business. So 
They don't. No, but Laura, but Laura, if you if you have a target, that means there's the possibility of failure. I, I don't. That's true. I don't know about that. That is true, and it's not a revenue target because we don't market to buckets of revenue. We market to customers, whether those are new customers or existing customers. That's what marketing does. We don't market to buckets of revenue. We are responsible. We are the only organization with the word market in our title. Therefore, we are supposed to know the market, and the market is comprised of an ecosystem that includes partners, competitors, and customers. And so that's our job is to know those. Mm -hmm. And um, 80% of value creators can have performance targets for all of their marketing objectives and programs. And they're almost all outcome-based, whereas like campaign producers, maybe only 52% of them. So, you know, and back to those metrics chains, kind of similar, you know, 96 of the value creators, which is a very, that very small group of them, only 58 of them actually use metrics chains, Right. If you compare that to the sales enablers, which were 167 sales enablers out of that for over 400, only 60 of them mm -hmm. use metrics chains. And only 55 of the campaign producers, which is the rest of the group, which is 160, right, use right. chains. So that means that only 41% of all marketing organizations can produce those metrics chains. That's why we're, in ch we're being challenged by the C-suite. Because if you don't have the metrics chains, mm. which often in incorporate these performance targets, then you can't get to the last ingredient, which is dashboards. Because you can't make good metr uh, dashboards without performance targets and metrics chains. Yes, you can click on the button in a marketing tech tool and produce a visual report of the data in that tool. You can do that. But that's not the same thing as a performance management dashboard. And this is one of the things that best-in-class marketing organizations, the value creators, are really superior at doing. And their dashboards do three things that almost none of the other groups' dashboards do. They can monitor and measure marketing's objectives as they are producing results to the outcomes. They can analyze the performance of the campaigns and other marketing activities, and they can track their marketing metrics, the key performance indicators that are going to tell them whether they're on track in real time. This allows them to make course adjustments, mitigate risk, and facilitate better decisions. So those are the five things in a nutshell. Perfect. And and so, Laura, I, so I know we, we wanted to, to revisit very quickly after we went through sort of these, the five things that the best in class marketers do better than their peers. Again, we've got the business acumen. Uh, they select the right metrics. They have their metrics chains. They um, set performance targets and they have these, these performance management dashboards. But why does that all matter to the C-suite? I know we wanted to we wanted to wrap it up and bring it back to that last question. Well, I think what matters is what if you can do these things, does it make a difference to the business? And what we ask and look at in this data is uh, the business results by for these organizations and then compare that to the business results produced by each of the personas. And so we look at things like revenue growth, marketing contribution to the pipeline, the win rate the share of wallet, customer retention, the ability to acquire new customers, um, the increase in the inquiry rate, the ability to improve customer loyalty, and the ability to generate new opportunities. And it, with the exception of win rate, which I'm going to come back to in a moment, value creators are much better in every single one of those. So things that might fall into the tr traditional camp of sales enablers and campaign producers, right? Still, the, val the value creators are better at those things, <laughs> even though that's not their area of focus. So that shows you, you know, stepping back and, and having these capabilities will help you even address the things that campaign producers and sales enablers tend to focus on myopically. So it will mm -hmm. just automatically the halo of that. Now, win rate, interestingly enough, none of them do very well on uh, affecting um, that those value creators are about exactly the same as their other uh, as their counterparts, as their colleagues. And I think that has a lot to do with the sales organization, right? Because the cloth, who's really closing the deal? So I'm not really surprised by that, but it's interesting that as marketing gets further and further into the relationship with the customer and the responsibility of, of moving those opportunities closer to the close, it will be interesting to see how that plays out. 
Absolutely. And uh, so again, we've been talking with Laura Patterson. Laura, you're clearly an expert in this area. You've been doing research for for decades, tracking metrics. And I really appreciate you sort of sharing some of the lessons that you've learned from this incredible study you've been doing. And I know you could continue to talk about um, you know, best in class marketers and and value creators. And I want to continue to talk to you about it. If any of our listeners are interested in possibly following up about today's topic, if, if they want to learn a little bit more about vision edge marketing, um, or they want to connect with you, what's the best way for them to go about doing that? Well, I hope they'll come visit us on, on our website, which is visionedgemarketing.com because we have a tremendous amount of content and resources there. We really want to see every marketing organization join the ranks of the best in class and for the best in class to continue, you know, on their journey. So we have a lot of content there. I'm always receptive to uh, receiving a, a, an email or a LinkedIn invite. Uh, so my email is Laura P for Patterson at visionedgemarketing.com. And you can find me on LinkedIn and anyone can reach out to me there. And that's just, uh, on LinkedIn and it's, you know, Laura Patterson, VEM. Um, happy to follow folks on Twitter and, and other places, but those are probably the first two places to start to connect. Perfect. Well, Laura, thank you again so much uh, for your time and your expertise today. It really was a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. If you're a B2B marketer, we want to feature you on sites like the Huffington Post, Social Media Examiner, and Chief Marketer. Every week, we send out a question related to B2B marketing. We use the responses to those questions to fuel the content we write for really popular websites. So head over to sweetfishmedia.com slash questions and sign up today. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.